This is a pretty short lecture, and really the purpose of this is just to give you an intuitive feel of how finite difference time domain is working and, and what it can do. I don't think you're going to leave this lecture with an ability to sit down and immediately write computer code. The, the following lectures will cover that, but I think you'll have an understanding of what is actually happening and then what makes it useful and maybe even what some of its limitations are. So this lecture is divided in two parts. One, I just want to tell you what is FDTD to give you an intuitive feel, and then we'll discuss the theory. What's the theory underneath the hood that lets this work? And that'll be the end of this lecture, pretty short. So what is FDTD? It is solving Maxwell's equations in the time domain. That means we're literally making movies of the fields, and we can actually do that. We can go into MATLAB, we can write our finite difference time domain, and we can save each frame as a movie. So you can imagine each little frame being one iteration in our code. Now, because it's time domain, this makes it really, really good for modeling transient phenomena. A frequency domain solver is not nearly as good at doing that as, as a time domain solver. So that's it. We're, we're making movies of the fields. So this, is a, this was a project actually done the first time I taught this class by some students, and it's a simulation of a radar. And so we have a, a, some kind of airplane there, and you'll see in the, the top center, we have this burst of radio frequency, so that's the radar, and you'll see those waves diffract around and reflect from that airplane. And then, in fact, it would go back to the receiver, and in principle, the radar could determine what is happening you know, or what, what it interrogated. Now, you'll notice the, the outer bounds of this are sort of these, these gray, grayed off or darker regions. Those are our PMLs. Those are the absorbing boundaries. And you'll notice when waves enter these regions, they don't reflect from them, but they go into them and then just sort of disappear. And in these perfectly matched layers, we're building in loss. And the loss is a, what is absorbing the waves. So here's another very similar sim uh, simulation. Let's get this movie running. And what you'll see is another RF burst come out and now it's reflecting off of two airplanes. And what you'll see on the right is the return signal from that radar. So that first burst that you just saw, that was from the first airplane. Second burst is from the second airplane. And you can also see those waves getting absorbed in the the PML regions, the perfectly matched layers. Okay, on to the theory of finite difference time domain. Hopefully what we've discussed gives you a feel for what FDTD looks like. Let's discuss what's happening underneath the hood. What makes this work? So this all starts with Maxwell's equations, and we will focus here exclusively on the curl equations. And so we look at this first curl equation, we can interpret this one of two ways. We could say that a time-changing magnetic field, so if the H field is changing at a particular point, that will induce a curling electric field. The electric field will curl around it. So a time-changing magnetic field induces a circulating electric field around it. Likewise, if we started off and induced the encircling, encircling electric field, it would induce a change in the magnetic field at the center of that circulation. We can look at the other curl equation the exact same way. A time-changing electric field induces an encircling magnetic field, or if we first induce the encircling magnetic field, that would cause a change in the electric field at the center of that circulation. The next thing we'll do is approximate the derivatives with finite differences. We will ignore the derivatives inside the curl operations right now and just look at the time derivatives. So what is a derivative? Well, it's slope, rise over run. So let's look at the time derivative of the electric field. How much does the electric field change divided by how much the time changes? So we will choose a time step, and this will be a very, very short time step, uh, much, much less than the frequency of our wave that we're interested in. So the electric field at the future time step minus the electric field at a previous time step, divided by the duration of the time step, that gives us our estimation 
for our time derivative. And of course that equals the curl. The next thing we'll do from those equations is derive something that we call our update equations. And what we're showing at the lower left here is just a repeat of those finite difference equations. What we'll do then is we'll take each of these two equations and solve for the E and the H fields at the future time steps. So let's look at this equation, our update equation for the electric field. The electric field at the future time step, or our next time step, equals the electric field at the current time step plus the curl of the magnetic field times some constants. And the same thing for the magnetic field. The magnetic field of the next time step equals the magnetic field of the previous time step plus or minus some correction factor that comes from the curl of the electric field. So we now have our update equations, and these are what gets programmed into our computer codes. So here's our first block diagram. Initially, we will set all of the fields to zero. Then we enter our main finite difference time domain loop, which is iterating over time. And the first thing it will do is it will look at our first update equation, and it will update the electric field based on the magnetic field. So it will calculate the curl of the magnetic field, multiply it by this constant, a ratio of constants, add that to the current value of the electric field to get the future value. So in, in essence, we're really calculating the electric field from the magnetic field. We have this other equation where we're updating the magnetic field based on the curl of the electric field. And now this bounces back and forth. We update E from H, we update H from E. E from H, H from E. E from H, H from E. And this repeats, and this cycles. And that is the FGTD engine happening. So we calculate E from H, H from E. So H, E, H, E, H, E, H, E. Bounces back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But nothing's happening. So we have to somehow get power into our system here. We, have, we need some kind of source for anything interesting to happen. So that's the next thing we do. After we update the electric field from the H field, we'll go in and we'll overwrite or add to or, or change some of the values in the electric field to incorporate a source. And then when we update the H field from the E field, we'll do the same thing again except on the H field. We'll modify some of those values in some way that incorporates the source. So at first, we initialize everything to zero, and we're iterating back and forth, eh, 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 but nothing's happening because everything's zero. Suddenly, in some part of the array, as we're going back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, somewhere in the array, numbers start to appear because we're modifying numbers, we're putting in a source. Now all of a sudden that there's numbers, and we're updating eh, 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 we can start to see those numbers propagate through our array. And that's exactly what's happened. That is our wave. That's our electromagnetic pulse or electromagnetic wave or whatever it is. It's now propagating through the grid. And if there's any materials on the grid, we can watch those waves diffract and reflect and scatter and do all kinds of crazy things. But we need to visualize it. So what I normally do is after all the update stuff, is I will visualize the fields to the screen. Now this slows down your code but it's great for troubleshooting. We can watch things happen, or maybe you just want to watch the simulation to become intuitive of how the device is working. But if you don't care about that, you probably would want to at least turn this off or only update the graphics every thousand iterations or something like that, because this really, really slows it down. But it's great for learning. And for small models, it's really not that significant, the, the slowdown. But the same thing's happening. We update E from H, inject sources, visualize. EH, visualize, EH, visualize, EH, visualize. And we're iterating through time this way. But eventually these waves will hit the boundaries, and if we don't do anything, it will bounce off the edges of our grid and come back in. And even though this shouldn't do that, our waves should look like they go off to infinity. So we need to do something for the boundaries. So now we modify our updates. We, we update E from H as normal, but we have to handle the edges of our grids or arrays specially to handle that, to make the waves appear as if they're going off to infinity. And we also have to update for the source. Then we update the A field from the E field. We handle the boundaries and we handle the source. And then maybe visualize the iteration. So it's still the basic EH, 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 EH engine, but we're building layers now. We're handling the boundaries so the waves hit the boundaries and just 
appear as if they keep going, we're injecting sources, and we're visualizing. But we're not there yet because we need to record and calculate meaningful stuff from the model. So what is normally done is after we update the fields, we might record the fields wherever we're interested in seeing those. And then when we're done, we can post-process those recorded fields and learn all kinds of things. Transmission and reflection versus frequency, uh, max power, a whole bunch of other stuff. But we may also want to incorporate completely crazy material properties, in which case we deviate from the basic EH, 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 EH viewpoint and we'll modify that. And instead, we will update the D field from the H field and update E from D. And this update comes from the constitutive relation. And so all of the complex material properties are sort of pulled out of this Maxwell's curl equation and put into a much simpler equation. So it's a great way to write a finite difference time domain code. Then we handle the boundaries, we handle the source, we'll go to the other curl equation and update B from E, then we go back to the constitutive relation, update H from B, so all of the magnetic material properties get lumped into this pretty simple equation, we don't have to touch the curl equation. Then we handle the H field of the boundaries, we handle the H field source, and everything else is the same. So it's really still the same EH, EH, EH iteration, but we've built in more bells and whistles. So what are the benefits of doing this? Well, it turns out most numerical algorithms scale exponentially. In other words, if we double the size of the problem, the number of computations goes up by 4 or 16 or 32 times, and it absolutely explodes. Finite difference time domain, the, the argument is that it scales linearly. We double the size of the problem, we only double the number of computations. I would argue it's a little bit worse than that, but we'll say that it scales linearly. So that's a very, very unique thing about finite difference time domain. Also, since it's time domain, we can excite our problem with an impulse. We can let that impulse go bounce around, do all kinds of things, and wherever we're interested in, we'll record the response to that impulse. So we are recording an impulse response in one simulation, and all we have to do in the end is Fourier transform those, and then we know the, the frequency response. From one simulation, we get the, the, the response over an incredibly broad range of frequencies. So it's very good for transient and broad broadband simu simulations. It's a very simple method. It's accurate, it's robust, it's mature. There's gobs and gobs of literature out there, and even free codes on finite difference time domain. It also naturally handles nonlinear behavior. So in other words, if your material properties are somehow a function of the strength of the field, so as your fields get stronger, the material properties change, that is something nonlinear. That's actually very difficult to handle in a frequency domain code. Not impossible, just pretty difficult. In a time domain setting, it's easy and almost obvious. So I also think finite difference time domain is great for learning electromagnetics. We can simulate the devices. You can literally watch the fields bounce around and, and do their electromagnetic thing, and you become very intuitive about how devices are working. So it's just a great method for that. There are some drawbacks. Um, with, with a time domain code. If, if your material properties are a function of frequency, it's pretty tedious to incorporate dispersion. Not impossible, and it's done all the time, but it's, it's not nearly as easy as with a frequency domain code. Usually, finite difference time domain is implemented on structured Cartesian grids. So if we have some kind of curved surface, that's not very efficient. Uh, there are some modifications to handle that, but the basic Cartesian grid flavor of finite difference time domain does not handle that well at all. And for very small devices, I would say finite difference time domain is a pretty slow method. Using a frequency domain solver, usually you can get the answer much, much more quickly. Although, it's, since it's a small device, it still runs pretty quick. You can still get very intuitive about things, but it's definitely slower than a frequency domain code. And the other thing I'll leave you with is if the device you're modeling is very, very resonant, this is not an efficient way to model that. So we think of a wave hitting a resonant device, it couples energy into that, that energy now resonates and it's stuck there. And we have to keep running the simulation and running it, running it, running it until finally 
that energy bouncing around in your device leaves the device and we can record it as either transmitted or reflected waves, but it'll stay stuck there. We just have to keep running and running. So the, the simulations are much longer in time duration for highly resonant devices and so it slows things down. And I'll leave you on the last slide. If you want more information, there's a good Wikipedia page on finite difference time domain. Uh, if you want a simpler introduction textbook, there's a textbook by Sullivan. Um, the reviews I read online really slam this book. I'm not really sure why. I think, it's a, I think it's an excellent book to learn finite difference time domain. It breaks it down. It simplifies it. So I think this is actually a pretty good book. There's another sort of more advanced uh, textbook, also by Taplov and some others called Advances in Finite Difference Time Domain Computational Electrodynamics, published by Artec House, and there's a lot of advanced topics in there.